Hey everybody, this is Dennis here with Respiratory Sensei and Lindsay Jones. This is part two of the segment on ventilator waveforms. A very nerdy topic to be sure, but fun. And if you're a nerd, if you're an ICU nurse or respiratory therapist or anybody involved in the ventilator or looking at these waveforms or taking care of patients who are in critical care, come along and let's take a look at ventilator waveforms. Today we're going to concentrate on ventilatory loops or graphic loops on the ventilator. All right, so the first thing we are going to recap is that last time we talked, we talked about waveforms, but today we're going to talk about loops, and I want to just show you a minor difference in these things. So let's go to the whiteboard and just kind of recap what we talked about. Whenever we are looking at waveforms, we're looking at something that looks like this. Now, this is just two examples, but notice here that we talked about pressure talked about pressure here, and in this case flow, but we also talked about both of them versus time. And so because it's related to time, then what's happening here is that the graph is going to automatically have a starting point, which is going to be over here, and an ending point at some point. So the graph is always going to show from left to right, because that's what time is. Now, whenever we change up the parameters, instead of talking about pressure versus time or flow versus time, and we look at those things versus one another, in other words, pressure versus flow or volume versus flow, then what we end up with is a circle. And I call it a circle, but here's what I mean. If I were to just kind of do a graph here, and let's say I'm looking at, down here I'm looking at pressure, and now I'm going to look at pressure versus volume, the graph is going to look like this because it's really tracking a person's breath. And so don't we have an inhalation that starts like this? And then we're going to come back with exhalation and we're going to end up right in the same point that we started with. So it's not a linear graph from left to right. It's more of a loop because we're tracking our breath cycle. And cycle means circle. And so that's what this is. All right. And so because of that, if we take a look, for instance, at this first one, this is called a flow volume loop. You may have heard of that in pulmonary function testing if you're a respiratory therapist. If you're a nurse, maybe you have heard of that, maybe not. But it doesn't matter, but we can track the same thing when we're looking at somebody on a ventilator. All right, and so what we have here, just to look at its common characteristic, we do have inhalation going on here, and so the breath is going to be given to the ventilator, the flow is going to eventually stop, and now the flow is going to come in reverse, and it's going to start going out until the patient is done breathing out. And then what happens is the flow is going to absolutely stop. Because when you're done breathing out, you're done, right? And so you're going to get this straight B line back to the zero point to finish the circle. And so that's what a normal flow volume loop is supposed to look like. But let's take a loop, look at a loop that's a little bit messed up. Okay, and it's this one right here. And what you're going to notice here, just to concentrate on what's normal here, the first part of this loop definitely is normal as it goes up like this. But the second part should show that there's a B line directly for zero, but it doesn't. As you can see here, it shows this little scoop right here. And so this is what we call a scoop. And some people call it a scoop in the loop, and that's a good way to remember it. So a scoop in the loop. And what are we to determine from that? Well, if somebody is having trouble breathing out for any reason at all, they may start off good breathing it out, but then something is holding them back. That's called an obstruction. A chronic pulmonary obstructive disease patient would demonstrate a scoop in their loop because as they try to breathe out, their lungs collapse or their airways collapse, and that causes an exhalatory obstruction, so it can't go out as fast. And it starts off kind of fast and maybe gets faster and then slower just because of the way their airways are. And so what you want to think about is that this is an obstruction. Now, if it's COPD, there's not a lot you can do about that. But what if somebody just has secretions in there? They're having trouble getting air out past the secretions. Well, then we could suction them. And then if they're having bronchoconstriction, they're having wheezing, they're having temporary collapse of their airways because of that constriction, then we can help with that by just giving them a bronchodilator. Or if they have chronic inflammation because of asthma, we can help that by just giving a corticosteroid. So we can address these things. And for some patients, we can get rid of that scoop in their loop. For a COPD patient, really hard to do that. But anyway, that's what you need to know about a flow volume loop. All right, now let's take a look at my favorite. 
which is really a pressure volume graph or pressure volume loop. From this loop, we can tell most about the patient. I love this one, so I want to show you a few things that we can determine from the patient. But let's label this thing and see what we see here. So first of all, this little point right here is the point at which we are starting the loop. Notice that on this particular graph, it's starting off at 5. That is also called PEEP. And we talked about that as also called the baseline pressure. And so I can tell from just looking at a graph where the peep is, it's the lower left side of this shape, which many people call a football. We'll call it that. So here's the football. All right. And then if you look up at this point, remember there are two things that can be told. If you follow the graph down straight, straight, I'll try to be as straight as I can here, we'll come up with some kind of pressure. Now from, from looking at that, that's probably maybe a pressure of say 34, and that would be the peak pressure. And then of course, if you follow this straight over, I'll do my best to be straight here, then what we'll get is a tidal volume of about 650. So we can look at the graph to see what our parameters are. But those are the two indicators of that upper inflection point. It'll tell you the tidal volume and it also tell you the peak inspiratory pressure so we can tell that all right but now let me just show you a couple of other things with this I'll just draw this um, sometimes you'll walk into a patient's room and you'll turn on the pressure volume graphic and it'll look like this and if it looks like that that's a problem but not in the way it's not a problem with the patient it's actually a problem with the way you're demonstrating the graph. Specifically, what we want to look at here is the problem with the scaling right here. Okay, here's what I mean. This scaling is appropriate, but what if we were to change the scaling on the ventilator, and you can, and this right here were to become 500, and then the next hash mark were 1,000, and the next hash mark would be 1,500, and then this one's 2,000. I don't know anybody with the tidal volume in 2,000. And so what you're going to get is this very, very flattened waveform. So take a peek. If we go straight across here, looks that, like we're at a tidal volume of about, let's say, 800. Well, the answer here is just to change the scale. And so let's just do that. All right, so this would be an appropriate scale. Look, the top part of this thing is at about 800. And so maybe 800,000, that would be a good top part, maybe 1,100. And then whenever you do a pressure volume graphic, then it's going to look normal. It's going to go like this, and it's going to go back down. And as you can see here, if I were to follow this over, it looks like I have a tidal volume of maybe about 650. And that's normal. How do you know what's normal scaling? So here's how to determine that. And by the way, this is on the NBRC examination. If you're preparing that, if you're a new respiratory therapist, if you're a nurse working, just watch this and you'll see what we're talking about. But what we're looking for is that the angle of this football, this pressure volume graphic, should be about 45 degrees. So the first thing you need to do when you want to look at a pressure volume graphic to determine what the patient is doing, how you're doing with the patient, is to first make sure the scaling is right. And if the scaling is right, then you can do your evaluation. And that's why we talk about that first. All right, so that's scaling. All right, let me talk about something else that you've probably seen before if you've been in this at all. So as we said earlier, that it should look, let's say we have somebody starting on a PEEP of five. So it should look something like this and it should look something like that. And that would be a normal pressure volume graphic. But sometimes what you'll see is that right here at the top, there will be a little there will be a little beak that looks like that. And if I were to ask a lot of people, line them up and say, hey, is that beak good or bad? Most people would say it's bad. Now be careful. If you're in Boston area in the East Coast, a lot of them think it's good to have a little bit of a beak. But let me talk to you about why. That beak has a very specific inflection point here and here. And of course we have this one down here. Remember that's peep. But this right here, remember, is going to be peak pressure. But that's also going to tell us our volume if we go over this way and if we come down this way. But what is that other thing? Well, this right here has a very special name. It is the point of over distension, and it is the point at which the lungs are full. If the lungs are full at that point, then if we try to put more air in, then the the pressure is going to increase drastically. Just try to imagine blowing up a balloon and there's pressure in there, but if it's already tight and taut and you put even more in there, then it's going to blow up even more and the pressure is going to double maybe in that last little breath that you put in. If you're not careful, you'll pop the balloon, right? And that's why we care about lungs. Lungs are like a balloon. If we go beyond the full point, then we could pop the lungs and get a pneumothorax. 
So we do care about that. All right, and so what I can tell from this graph, though, is that I may have them on a tidal volume of, say, 700, but if I looked at the point of overdistension, which is also the point at which the lungs are full, I may come across here and recognize that a tidal volume of 575 would be more appropriate for that patient. And so even though the doctors come in, done some math, you've done some math, you've decided, hey, the best tidal volume according to their weight and their height is uh, 700, doesn't mean that's true. That patient may be different. They may have smaller lungs than the average patient. And so you'll do a customized tidal volume study, which is what this is, look at the point of over distension, run the numbers and realize actually 575 for this patient would be perfect. Now why do we care about a perfect tidal volume? Because if we go above that tidal volume, we could pop their lungs and cause barotrauma or a pneumothorax. But if we were to go below that point of overdistension, then we might be underventilating them. Now, if we're able to figure out exactly how much volume it takes to fill somebody's lungs up, here's what we can do. We can drastically decrease the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Because look, or pneumonia in general, because if we get air in every single alveoli, it's very hard for secretions to develop there and stay there. If air gets in the alveoli under the secretions, that air is going to come right back up and it's going to take the secretions with it. And so there's great therapeutic value in helping us to do that. All right, so that's, that's one reason why we do it that way. All right, let's take a peek now at another part of this graph, if you will. Remember I said the beak could be considered good in some scenarios, but this is not good. Let's say we have a beak that comes up like this, and then there's a big, gigantic beep like that. That's definitely not, not good no matter how you look at it. Because look what's happening. If we look at the tidal volume here, we may have the patient set at about 700. Point of over distensions right here, meaning they should be on about 500. And if we could just lower the tidal volume from 700 to tidal, to 500, that's when we're going to get a normal looking loop. And look what happens. We cut off this portion right here, which if you think about is almost doubling the amount of pressure, not quite, but we're exposing the patient to way too much pressure. When in reality, we could just lower the tidal volume just a little bit and then get rid of a whole lot of pressure and a whole lot of exposure to barotrauma and other uh, barrel risks that could happen. All right, so those are just a few things that you need to know. I want to show you just one more thing that's kind of interesting, and that is that you can look at the edges of the graph to determine a variety of things. Okay, so here's what I mean. Inhalation's coming up here like this. And then it's the exhalation's gonna go like this, and sometimes right at the back part of this, you'll see a little bit of jaggedness like this, then it stops. If you see that, that means there's some kind of flutter during exhalation. And what that probably is, is secretions. And so it would be an indication that you probably need to suction the patient. Or if it's super fine flutter, it could also be bronchoconstriction. And if you have bronchoconstriction, then you probably just need to give a bronchodilator. All right, and so that's what that is. So that's a little bit more information. We could be very nerdy and spend 30 minutes to an hour just talking about the pressure volume loop. You can tell a lot from it, but there are some basics. I hope that was helpful to you. If you do find these videos helpful, keep watching. We'll go into greater detail and we'll talk about more topics. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. And also like it and give me some comments. Tell me what you'd like to see in the future. All those things are very helpful to our channel, Respiratory Sensei, which is all things respiratory for everybody. All right, and until next time, we'll see you. This is Dennis from Respiratory Sensei.